Hello, welcome back. Um, in this video, we're going to go over an example of how to construct the statement of cash flow using the indirect method. Um, before you continue, and if you haven't done so, I encourage you to pause the video and download the template that goes along with this lecture. Uh, the template is located on the um, course website. Uh, there, these are the information we're going to go over them before we dive into the construction. So here is the income statement for two years, um, and it's important to include the nooks in the income statement. So um, the nooks will give us information about the non-cash expense. So based on the nooks, we know the amount of depreciation expense. Um, and we also know whether or not any equipment or assets were sold or acquired during that time. Um, we also um, know that uh, amortization, which is another non-cash expense for the year, um, and they uh, sold some pattern, which is a um, non-fixed asset, uh, but also a long-term asset, and they sold it at no gain or no loss, so that makes it a little bit simpler. Um, and we understand that uh, changes in deferred income tax uh, consider operating activities. We also have the balance sheet for this company for three years. Again, we need um, two years of balance sheet items for us to identify the changes. So here we have um, current assets um, and then uh, long-term assets and also um, current liability and also um, liabilities and um, stockholders accounts. So now let's switch over to the template. So the template uh, basically contains all the information that you saw, um, including the balance sheet item as well as income statement items. And we also included the nooks that was in, uh, that were um, uh, that were provided to us. Uh, so the nooks includes depreciation and amortization expenses, which are non-cash expenses. So what we are going to do is to create the um, a worksheet for to compute the statement of cash flow for year eight. There are obviously many strategies to do this. Um, the one that I'm going to demonstrate is one that I prefer is um, I find is uh, systematic and it's easier to understand where the changes come from. So I'm going to do this in multiple steps. First, I'm going to compute uh, a column here that represents changes in the balance sheet items. And then I will look at separate them into operating items. investing items and financing items. So we're going to first start with um, changes that are just year to year changes. So we're going to do this for year eight. So for year eight, when we compute the changes means that we take the changes in uh, subtract year seven from year eight. Also remember, we are not going to include cash when we compute this change. And the reason why um, I include an increase in assets as a negative number is because an increase in asset is a use of cash. So um, when we see that an, an asset increase, that's actually a cash outflow. So we said this is equal to year seven minus year eight. So asset actually increase, right, by $168,000, but this is represented as an, an outflow. So we'll do that for accounts receivable investments, prepayment, as well as the fixed assets. So, so far we have changes in asset. Next, we're going to compute the increase or decrease in liability, but we're going to reverse the formula here. And the reason for that is because um, for liability is the opposite. An increase in liability is an inflow of cash uh, and a decrease in liability is an outflow of cash because we're paying off uh, our liability instead. So similar to what we did with asset, we include all the accounts, um, of course, not including the, the subtotals. So for the liability, we, as I said, we take the opposite. So we take year eight minus year seven. 
Again, that is because an increase is an inflow and a decrease is an outflow. Um, so here our accounts payable actually went down, which means we pay off some of our um, vendors. Uh, the same thing, for, uh, the opposite is true for note payable to banks. We notice that that increases, which means that um, between year seven and year eight, during year, during year eight, uh, we borrow more money. So we have an additional $220,000 that we borrow from the bank that is available for us to use. Uh, current liability went down. Uh, Long-term debt went up. So again, we borrow more money. That's info that we can use to finance um, our other activities. Same is true for the equity account. So now we have um, basically computed the, the changes in the balance sheet and um, we use the direction of the change such that it is consistent with the cash flow. So a negative number here represents a cash outflow, a positive number here represents a cash inflow. The next step is to separate these items into the three categories, the operating, investing, and financing. So remember that operating activities include current assets and current liability. So here are the current assets. And current liability, remember, except the um, current portion of NOx payable. So current liability include accounts payable and other current liability. So once we have created this, we can just pick up the, the items that we have identified. So, so and then uh, and remember another note that we have is that deferred income tax is considered an operating activity. So those are all the footnotes that we need to take into account. So here are the last item from uh, the balance sheet that will go into the operating category. Next, we're going to pick up uh, information from the income statement and the footnotes that are related to the operating activity. So as far as um, stockholders account, common stockholders account, uh, we'll pick up net income. So net income is a total of 417,000. And then in terms of property plan and equipment, we know that we have depreciation of 641,000. And then for um, other assets that would include the patents, uh, and we know that patent uh, amortization is 25,000. So here we have, so notice that I'll highlight those for you. So these three items, the $417,000 is from uh, net income, from the income statement. And then the $641,000 is from depreciation. And then the $25,000 is from patent amortization. So now we have um, all the operating activities. Next, we're going to pick up the investing activity. So investing activity represents the gross change, so not just the um, net change um, in investing activity. So we know that we saw off net change of 792000 plus we wrote, we, uh, wrote down $641,000 as depreciation. So our total change in invest, investing um, activity is actually the difference between the two. So uh, we actually have a, um, a cash outflow um, of 1433. Um, the same is true for other assets and amortization. So these two together. So those are money that we actually expended. So those are investing activity. Notice that investing activity is almost exclusively associated with the asset side. Now we're going to look at financing activity, and that is focusing on the liability side. So financing activity, we know we brought in 220000 from uh, changes in notes payable, uh, also long-term debt. 
uh, as well as preferred stock and common stock. And then finally, uh, in here, we'll need to increase, in, um, include finance activity or dividends that we pay. Uh, in this particular case, we know that um, the only dividend that we pay was dividend on common stock, uh, on preferred stock. So that will be included in here. And now we have separated. Uh, we have um, accounted for the three categories of operating, investing, and financing. We can compute the total and make sure that everything reconciles. So if you look at the change in cash, so between um, year eight and year seven, um, cash actually increased by $45, right? For, we went from $430 to $475. So let's take a look at if um, our calculation adds up, adds up. So let's sum up all the um, cash flow associated with investing activity, as well as investing and financing activity. So if we add up this, it did turn out to be $45. So our change in cash is $45 and is equal to um, a negative operating activity, a negative investing activity, and a positive financing activity. So what does that mean? First, I want to um, remind you that the company actually make money in year eight. It has a net income of 417000 Dollars and you also have um, a net income available to common stockholder of four hundred and five thousand dollars. However, um, most of the cash, now the increase in cash is only forty five thousand dollars, and we can see that the majority of this is used to pay down um, accounts payable, um, and also in current and and also um, other current liabilities. Uh, in addition, um, the company invested a lot in equipment. So um, it does, uh, and the company managed this by borrowing. So it increased long-term debt significantly and also increased um, preferred stock to finance uh, both the shortfall from operating cash flow and also um, its capital expenditure. Now that you have actual working experience of how to um, compute and perform a, uh, a statement of cash flow analysis, let's take a look at um, how we can use it. How do we use the statement of cash flow um, to help us identify accounting and risk? So there are two ways we can do that. Well, we talked about it earlier. Um, the accounting, uh, the statement of cash flow will, is useful for us to identify a firm's strategy and also where a firm is in its uh, life cycle. So the last uh, example that we went through, the company borrowed a lot of money to invest is in its um, capital expenditure. So it's highly likely that the company is still in a growth stage. It also can help us understand whether or not the, um, the net income uh, re that we see represents the underlying business strategy and economics of the, of the company. And then finally, it highlights the um, accounting accruals um, which, uh, and how the company uses it. Um, and that will give us some idea into how sustainable um, the company is and the overall quality of the firm's reported earnings. To, get, to uh, demonstrate this, let's take a look at another example. So here are um, a number of um, companies. So we identify them by numbers, one through eight, and they belong to eight different businesses. So um, for, uh, one of them is Biogen, is a high growth company uh, very early in, the, in its life stage. Um, Chevron is in a mature um, oil business. Um, 
Heinz food product. Again, very mature. So uh, oil is likely to be more volatile, higher risk uh, than food product. Uh, Home Depot is again um, uh, a growth company. Um, so you can take a look at the um, eight different business and I'm going to ask you to pause the video and try to guess which company has the following characteristics and I'll review that uh, when you come back. So pause the video, try to figure out uh, which company is number one, which one is two and so forth. Welcome back. Are you ready for the review? So let's first take a look at company number one. Its growth in revenue is negative, which puts it in the mature category for sure. And then we saw that net income is relatively high, 34.9%. Uh, Those said that is a very um, uh, lucrative, um, meaning high profit margin. Um, depreciation is relatively high, so it's in a company, in a business that has quite um, a high uh, fixed operating um, uh, leverage, meaning a lot of uh, capital in investment. Um, and then we take a look at the percentage changes in financing is increasing, is um, uh, in long-term debt. Um, so it's both increase and decrease, so it's actually overall paying off. It's, is is um is um is debt and then the cash flow from financing is also mostly negative uh so it is um it is in a cash flow stage so this is actually gonna this is actually chevron <laughs> so not surprising this is a um a mature uh, business and then firm number two Again, 5.7% that is relatively stable. Again, that is um, high, that is low growth. So that is mo more likely a mature uh, company again. And it is um, even selling off more of its, um, its business um, and has an even higher uh, depreciation percentage. Um, it has a very um, significant um, change in inventory, so it has an accumulated um, inventory. So this is um, another mature business. Company number two is Inland Steel. And three, once again, it is a mature business, 5.7 in growth. Um, it has um, again, similar characteristics, but it's e even selling more of its assets. So all of these are in a liquidation um, declining stage. Um, it did a lot of stock repurchase. Um, it did less financing and the net change in cash again is, um, is decreasing. So, so it's actually using up cash. Um, this is specific gas and electric. So if you don't get it precisely correct, but at least if you identify all of this uh, in the mature sector, then you are you are in a great um, at least you're in in the right direction. Um, company number four has revenue growth of 23%. That puts it in a growth category. So let's take a look at the rest. Um, income is very high. Depreciation is also very high. So there's a lot of investment in there. Uh, let's take a look at um, assets. So again, is in a huge growth stage. It's investing a lot uh, in um, in a, some of the um, financing. So it's borrowing a lot more money. Um, it is divesting though. So that is interesting. Um, it, it, it has a lot of changes in, um, in what is going on. So that could very well be they are selling off some divisions. So that is a, um, a sign that the company is in a fast paced growth industry and company number four is Biogen. Company number five again is a high growth, 18.2%, uh, um, not as high as Biogen. So this is a more like a growth industry. Um, income is very high, 6.1%. 
Um, so this would be in a industry that is able to um, command very high premium. Um, Swift access is decreasing. Um, so is and it doesn't have um, a whole lot of accounts um, uh, inventory or accounts receivable. And this is Sun Microsystem number five. And then number six, we're back to 7.7% growth. So we are back to a mature industry. And by process of innovation, um, this is a service master. And then number seven, back to 8.6%, again, another mature industry, and that is Heinz. Um, and number eight, we're back to high growth, 28.3%, and that is um, Home Depot. So here we are using um, ratios to help us identify a firm's strategy. I encourage you to start looking at income statements and, um, and financial ratios for other companies and see if you can identify whether or not their uh, financial data is consistent with what the company's message is in terms of their corporate strategy. Here we conclude chapter three. I'll see you again very soon in chapter four.